that necessarily Washington was better, but it would be, you know, very homeboyish. So you go into the office to get your loan. There's been a two-year drought. You need to get some irrigation system. Oh, hey, Joe, you know, how's the wife? Da, 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 da. Application approved. Black farmer comes in, application in the trash for a 120-day waiting period. You compound these over decades, and the result was a lot of foreclosures for black farmers. Um, in 1999, black farmers sued the government, and they, they settled for the largest civil rights settlement in the history of the United States, the Pigford versus Glickman case. Um, the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights in 1982 said that the USDA was the number one cause of the decline of the black farmer and would have the blood on its hands of the extinction of the black farmer. So this was, a, this was generations and generations of discrimination and exclusion that result in the fact that right now, less than 1% of farmers are black in this country. Managers, not farm workers. And of course in the North, we know that land theft and wealth concentration had a different face, right? Anyone been on Zillow recently or know what Zillow is? Yeah, what's Zillow? It's a place to look for houses, it's a search engine. So I recently went on Zillow to look at the neighborhoods where we deliver food as a farm. And I was astounded to see that the neighborhoods where we deliver, which are intentionally what the USDA terms food deserts, so like poor areas without grocery stores, were all outlined in red. I was actually shocked. Any idea why I was astounded that Zillow had these neighborhoods outlined in red? Redlining is illegal, right? Redlining was started by the federal government in the 1930s when they commissioned all these maps to be made for banks. And the map said, these areas are highly desirable to give a mortgage. These areas are too risky to give a mortgage. By the way, the risky areas we will outline in red, and that is where people of color live. The result of this was catastrophic, I think beyond what they could even imagine. Because if you can't get a loan, right, you can't get a house. And if you can't get a house, you can't build wealth. And you can't pass that on to the next generation. The number one way that we gain wealth in this country is intergenerational. 80% of the wealth that is in this country is passed down right, between generations. And most of that is property. So when you came home from World War II and you were a veteran and you had the GI Bill, if you were white, you got the 0% mortgages. I can count on my two hands the number of black people who got those mortgages because of redlining. When I was born, the wealth gap White to black was eight to one. I'm not that old, and it's now 13 to one. So it's compounding generation and concentrating generation after generation because of this legacy. And it was astounding to see that even though it's illegal, and go check, look, look at Zillow, see what, you, what color your neighborhood is. Um, so what's the result of this, right? I was saying that the food system is working as designed. It's based on stolen land, it's based on stolen labor. And the result is what a lot of you all are dealing with here at Department of Health and in the community, right? Is that we have not just in terms of who can farm and who can uh, run their own businesses and have their own land, but also who accesses the food. Where do you think this young person is? Yeah, food pantry. Right? It's because of the dismantling of the entitlement system that people have to rely on food banks in the first place. But one in three black children goes to bed hungry in this country. One in six white children. Like neither of those numbers are acceptable, right? But that's very a stark racial differential. You have diabetes, heart disease, obesity, like poor eyesight, ADHD, depression. All these things can be linked to poor diets, disproportionately impact, impacting black and indigenous communities. Your access to supermarkets, whether you live in, in a food apartheid neighborhood where you know you have a few dollars in your pocket and you can get some hot Cheetos and blue drink, or can you get you know something that's actually going to nourish you and sustain your life and help you learn. And we still have the same situation with farm workers. I mentioned almost all of our food is grown by people who speak Spanish and who were um, identified Latinx or Hispanic, yet only 2% of farms are managed by people who identify as Latinx or Hispanic. So it's about power, control, and access. And then finally, we have a higher concentration of land ownership in the hands of one ethnic group than we've ever had since 1900 where almost all the rural land in this country is controlled by European heritage folks. And I'm all about sharing, like we can all have some, but this is, this is really problematic. <laughs> it's really problematic that you know, one group would control all of that resource because as, as, um, Martin Luther, as um, sorry, Malcolm X said, you know, land is the basis of all power, all freedom, all dignity, all justice, and so who controls that? And then the last thing I'll mention, just because we started with Mother Earth in this little piece, 
uh, before I give you all a break to talk to each other, is even as we're harming our human communities with a racist and broken food system, we also are harming the earth. You know, the industrial agriculture is the number one cause of climate change, the number one cause of water withdrawals, of land use conversion. And we know how to farm in a way that honors the earth and also sustains ourselves. You know, 70% of people are in this world are still getting their food using indigenous farming systems. So we know those technologies. But in a drive to corporatize, in a drive to consolidate, um, towards our limited understanding of efficiency, you know, we have a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. We have runaway wildfires. We have runaway hurricanes because of the climate change that is ensuing. And, you know, there's only so long that we can get away with that. And it's certainly disproportionately <coughs> impacting people of color. You know, I, I have a lot of farmers that I know um, are really climate refugees. They're leaving Mexico because there's not enough rain to grow their crop, you know. Um, same thing in Ghana, where I know a lot of farmers, too. So I'm going to pause, because that was, that was a lot of history, before we get to like, what we're doing about it. And but I would love for you to turn to a person next to you and debrief a little bit about where you see your ancestors, your people, in this history, um, and then give them a minute to also share about where they see their ancestors and people. Take two minutes. 